Okay, this is the last lecture for today. This covers total internal reflection. Okay, total internal reflection is a phenomenon that occurs when light refracts from a high to low index of refraction, say from water to air or from glass to air, for example. So let's say that right here is a boundary between two different indices of refraction. Let's say, for example, that this right here is glass or water, and then this right here is air. So specifically, N is greater than N prime. So as I said, we're going to have light refract from high to low index of refraction. So let's say that I have an incident light ray, like so. And then right here is the normal line. Right here is the angle of incidence like so. Now recall one of the basic rules. When you refract from a high to low index of refraction, you bend away from the dotted line. Like so. So right here is the angle of refraction. And then therefore Snell's law will now be written in the following way. We're going to have N for either glass or water times the sine of the incident angle equals then N for air, which I'll just write as 1, times the sine of the refractive angle. So then therefore N times the sine of the incident angle is just equal to the sine of the refractive angle. The refracted angle is greater than the incident angle. Okay, now imagine doing the following. Imagine taking a laser, which is how I'm going to demonstrate this for you in a little while. And then I take the laser, for example, and I move it in this direction such that the angle of incidence increases. If the angle of incidence increases, then the angle of refraction increases as well. I'm eventually going to get to a point, however, where the angle of incidence is at a specific value called the critical angle such that the angle of refraction is equal to 90 degrees. That looks like this. Okay, now once again, here's my boundary, like so. Okay, right here is my incoming light ray, like so. And then this right here specifically is referred to as the critical angle. We always write it as theta crit. The critical angle is the angle of incidence necessary such that a refracted angle is 90 degrees. So here's the refracted light ray, and then right here is the refracted angle which is equal to 90 degrees. Here's how you write Snell's law for this situation. So the left-hand side is N times the sine of the critical angle. That then equals on the right-hand side of the expression the sine of 90 degrees. The sine of 90 degrees is equal to one. Okay, now what happens if I then take the angle of incidence and I make it bigger than the critical angle? So now let's let the incident angle be bigger than the critical angle. If the angle of incidence, I'm going to use this expression right here to illustrate, if the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, then this product here is a number that is greater than 1. Therefore, n times the sine of the incident angle is greater than 1. Okay, now on the right-hand side of the expression, recall that the largest number that the sine of an angle could be is 1. So if this side of the expression is greater than 1, what could you say about this side of the expression? It literally doesn't exist. That is, the refracted angle doesn't exist. None of the light refracts from either the uh, water or the glass into the air. So therefore, the refracted angle doesn't exist. So if the refracted angle doesn't exist, well then what happens to the light? It is totally internally reflected, that is it stays within either the glass or the water. The situation looks like this. And once again here's the boundary between the glass or the water and the air. And then I have my incoming light ray like so. And here's the angle of incidence. The angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. So no light refracts then into the air. Instead, 
all of the light reflects here at the boundary like so between the glass or the water and the air. Right here would be a reflected angle. Like so, all the light stays within that medium. We refer to this situation as total internal reflection. Now I demonstrate this for you in two short demonstration videos, total internal reflection part one and part two. Before you take a look at those demonstration videos, however, let me explain what it is that you're going to see in the first of those two. Okay, so here's the first of those two demonstration videos. Okay, what I do in this demonstration video is I have right here, let me draw it in black like so, a tank of water. Let's say that right here is the water line like so. So right here is water, right here is air. So n is equal to one here, n is equal to 1.33 here. Okay, and then what I do is I take the laser and I shine it in on an angle like so in this direction, right here. Okay, now there is some refraction, for example, from the air to the glass and then from the glass to the water and so forth. I'm ignoring that here. I could safely ignore that because the thickness of the glass here is pretty small. Okay, there's also a reflection off the glass off in this direction and so forth. I'm ignoring that as well. The only thing that we're looking at right here is specifically this angle of incidence like so. Okay, and then if the angle of incidence is less than the critical angle, then the refracted angle is gonna be less than 90 degrees. You're gonna see the refraction then come out like so. Right here is the angle of refraction. And then what I do in the demonstration here off to the side is I place a piece of paper like so here in the water such that you can then see the laser spot hit the piece of paper. You can see the refracted light ray coming out into the air. And then what I do is I take the laser and I kind of draw it in this direction like so, thereby increasing the angle of incidence. And then specifically when I'm right at the right angle, the critical angle, then the angle of refraction is 90 degrees and the laser light itself is basically along the boundary here between the water and the air. And then lastly, I take the laser and I pull it in this direction such that the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. And then therefore, total internal reflection within the water occurs. No light then refracts into the air, so you don't see a laser spot then hit the piece of paper off to the side. Go ahead and take a look at that demonstration video now, and then also take a look at the second demonstration video as well. Okay, now that you've watched those two short demonstration videos, this initially sounds a little bit confusing, but mathematically it's actually quite simple. Let's just take a look at one basic problem here, and then I'll describe one of the applications that you saw in the second video with respect to fiber optic cables. But for now, let's take a look at our problem. This is the fourth problem for today's lecture examples. Go ahead and copy it down into your notes. So what is the critical angle between water and air? Basically what you were seeing in that first demonstration, and then what about between glass and air? All right, now mathematically there's actually nothing to this. Specifically, we just have to use this expression here, like so, such that the angle of incidence is equal to the critical angle, and then we're gonna have light refracting from either water or glass, to air. So then therefore we use this expression here and we just solve for the critical angle. So mathematically there's nothing to this. The sine of the critical angle here is just equal to 1 over n. Okay, so specifically let me call this part A. Let's say that n is 1.33 for the water tank demonstration. So then therefore I basically had the laser at just the right angle when the angle of incidence was the following. It's just the inverse sine of 1 over 1.33. So inverse sine of uh, 1 divided by 1.33, and that comes out to be nearly a 49 degree angle. A little bit less, but I'll go ahead and round it off like so. So that's basically what you were seeing in the demonstration. If instead we're talking about glass, 
you can actually see a little bit of total internal reflection within prisms, for example. I didn't describe, describe that in my prism demonstration video because it's just too hard to see in the video itself. You could usually easily see it, however, if I say pass the prisms around the room. But you can see some total internal reflection within a prism as well, where the index refraction here is 1.5. Okay, it's just a slightly different angle. So inverse sine of 1 divided by 1.5, and that comes out to be about a 42 degree angle in this case. Like so. So once again, mathematically, there's not much to this, even though initially, at least, it sounds a little bit confusing. Okay, let me say a couple of things about fiber optic cables here. Okay, fiber optic cables are also sometimes nicknamed light pipes. Okay, and then here's what's happening in that situation. Okay, this right here is a solid piece of plastic. Those plastic tubes that I was using in the second demonstration video, those were not hollow, as I mentioned. Those are solid pieces of plastic. And then based upon literally the molecular structure of the plastic itself, if you take light then, white light, for example, and just shine it through one end of this cylinder, then ultimately the light is totally internally reflected within the plastic itself. So basically it's doing something like this. The light is coming in on an angle like so, such that the angle of incidence here is greater than the critical angle, and then therefore the light does not refract into the air. Instead, it reflects within the plastic like so, and then basically you just have one reflection after another as the information then travels down the light pipe, travels down the cable. There are some enormous advantages to sending information in this manner by using fiber optics as opposed to, say, doing it electronically through copper cabling with an electronic signal. With copper cabling, first of all, you have to mine the copper out of the ground, which is extremely costly in terms of energy, and it's very destructive to the environment. You also have to refine the copper as well. That's a very dirty process. When it comes to manufacturing fiber optic cables, it's easy to do. Yes, it is plastic, so it's petroleum-based, but the amount of energy that's necessary to make thin plastic strands is a lot less than it is to, say, mine copper out of the ground. And then secondly, the speed of the transmission of the data. The speed of the transmission of the data when talking about fiber optics is literally the speed of light in plastic, which is at a much greater speed than that of an electronic signal through copper cabling. And then also with electronic signals, you also suffer very quickly from what is called signal loss due to a property associated with all wires called resistance. When it comes to signal loss, however, in fiber optics, the amount of energy that you lose as heat through the sides, for example, of the plastic itself is next to nothing. So there are huge advantages to sending data by using fiber optic cables as opposed to using old style electronic cabling. So over the last couple of decades worldwide, we've basically have been placing all the copper cabling, which dates back, by the way, to the late 19th century with fiber optic cables. Hopefully some of you have a fiber optics system at home. I certainly do. The amount of data transmission and the speeds of transmission of data with fiber optics, as you probably have discovered, is huge. You could run, for example, all of your devices basically at once in your house if you have a fiber optic system and you have very little problems when it comes to buffering and signal loss and so on and so forth, okay? Okay, that concludes today's series of lectures. Today's shirt was suffocation.